big question. I, I guess for me, the the first thing to do is is to decide what what battles you want to pick. Um, there's there's so much that can be better in in the worlds we work in, but actually, if you're going to to try and make your workplace better, you you really do need to think about where you're going to focus your efforts and how you're going to bring about that change. Uh, I'm quite a believer in in the, the kind of Cotter change model type system. Um, uh, so I guess for those who aren't aware, um, the first thing you do is you create a sense of urgency, which in this day and age often involves social media. Make people aware say some uncomfortable things, raise awareness, tell people, look, there's something in our in our system that is not right, that is not good, that is harmful, dangerous, toxic, or, or maybe just not good enough. And, and this is kind of the important bit, I think we can make it better. I think we can improve it. And that language there, we, we can improve it. It's not a them problem. They've, they've made it toxic. They're the problem. It's a, we a community are, are in this together because then you can go into the the next step which is uh, cotter talks about um creating a guiding coalition hey come join me do you share my core values do you share my belief that we can improve these things bring people on board and be reflective be self-aware enough to be like yeah you know what i'm good at x y and z but i'm rubbish at so for me i i have dyscalculia i can't do numbers i can't do spreadsheets so I need people who can do that stuff because when I try to do it, I screw it up and I screw it up spectacularly normally. Once you've got your coalition together, then you can sit around as a group of stakeholders with probably shared core values, but really different lived experience, worldviews. And you come up with your vision for change. How are you going to change your workplace? What does it look like? Is it going to be a campaign? Is it going to have a hashtag? Is it going to be a policy document? Is it going to be a is there going to be a protocol with flowcharts and arrows? What's it going to look like? How are you going to bring people on board? And then, and this is again the bit that people often don't get quite right, you have to communicate that vision to everyone. You need to let people know, look, we think that this is the issue. We think that this is how we're going to change it. And this is what we're going to do. And we'd like you to come along with us, support us, um, help us out in some way. What follows that in Cotter's model, and it is certainly my experience as well, is the next step is removing barriers, removing obstacles. You will, and what's interesting is when you try and change culture, you often can't help but think you're pushing against an open door. You know, most of my work in the advocacy space has been around equality, diversity, inclusion, anti-bullying, anti-harassment, anti-discrimination, anti-sexual anti assault and rape. All of these things you think would be easy wins and yet they're not so the next step is to remove those barriers and often that requires a whole different set of diplomatic skills that that you may need to develop or again bring people on board with and just go look i i don't know how to deal with very powerful people who just go no um what's interesting is after the the barriers bit you're normally knackered you're exhausted you know, you're running on reserves. It's often quite a relentless process. And so the next step is to create some short term wins, little wins, little victories, whatever that might be. Now, that might be a minor change in policy, or it might just be bringing someone on board, or it might just be your, you know, 10th follower on Instagram. It doesn't matter. You want those short term wins. A, to prove that you're heading in the right direction and B, just to help you get out of bed in the morning. Each one of those little wins creates what I call tectonic change. So you're not really aware of anything changing, but when you look back 5, 10, 15 years down the line, the, the whole world, the whole geography of your workplaces has altered kind of at a really foundational intrinsic level. And Cotter talks about consolidating those improvements. So it's about working hard to make sure that the changes you've made can't and don't slip back when you take the foot off the brake. 
go on holiday for two weeks, move to another unit. You need it needs to be sustainable. It needs to be maintainable, and then you are able to create those changes in a way that they're not going anywhere. And by creating those changes, you can create another sense of urgency and be like, look what we've done. Look what we've done. Look what we have done. Now the real work begins and the whole cycle starts again. And you keep doing it and you keep doing it. And and in, in change organizations that get that right, you see that cycle play out over and over and over again. You can kind of, it's like, you know, a formulaic movie you know what's coming and yet you're still like wow what a surprise they did it again and and it's the same thing with change management you 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 follow those steps and of course the nuance is sometimes the barriers don't take long to overcome sometimes the barriers are terrifying and take years to overcome and, and certainly in my experience the problem you have with real culture change and and the cotton model addresses it is also that it's iterative so you can never stop and that's why you have to build something that's sustainable because at some stages you have to stop just to eat and sleep and live and whatever because certainly in the world i move in and work in there are challenges that have presented themselves over the last 10 15 years of my advocacy that no one could have seen coming and that's the exciting bit of it, but also it highlights really nicely why previous attempts at changing healthcare culture have changed. Because people go, we are going to challenge the patriarchy. And a year later they go, job done. And you're like, how, what are you talking about? And and it's the same with, with anything. It, it It's a recognition that culture by its very, by its very nature is made up of the people in your organization. So as you change culture, so new problems will present themselves and, and new challenges and new things to address. And and for me, that's kind of the exciting bit. That's how you change culture in your workplace is by creating that sense of urgency, bringing people on board, having little wins, making those little wins stick, putting them all together into one big win so that you can bring more people on board, create a bigger sense of urgency and so the game continues. And and that's how to change the world in eight easy steps. Oh, so again, it's one of those, it's one of those on face value, really easy questions. And the reality is that it's, it's just not, which is the best way to teach or learn. For me, I got into teaching so that I would learn. I started teaching as a second year med student and unashamedly I got into teaching because my ego wouldn't allow me to not know what I was talking about. I hated, I hated, you know that you get taught, I don't know the answer, but I can find out for you sort of line that you learn in your, in your career. I hated that. I hated not knowing the answer. And what I found was by teaching others at that very, very junior stage, it motivated me to to internalize the knowledge, to really be able to understand it so that when someone went, mate, can you explain to me why you put the stethoscope on the chest and then you get them to sit forward? You need to be able to make it clear to them. You you, you don't want to have to go, well, it's, it's very complicated. You need to be able to just, you know, put it out there in a, in a clickbait type title. So they go, oh yeah, fine, good. Now I find that, that, that I teach because again, it, it is the way personally I find it hugely rewarding but also it's the way you change the way we do things the way we improve patient care the way we improve everything is is education for me there is something to be said about basically being the kind of teacher you wish you had which is a very reflective thing and I think the trap in your question is that there is no one answer if I say well for me, the real answer is bedside teaching. That's where the money is. You'll go, really? So there's no role for lectures or problem-based learning or tutorials or simulation or augmented reality or virtual reality. And the answer is the best way to teach 
is by decentering yourself from your educational paradigm, pedagogy, wh wherever you're coming from, and actually look at your learners. What do your learners want? What do they need? Because they are often two very different things. <laughs> and what have you got? What are your resources? Because yeah, you know what? There are some things where absolutely the best way for me to impart knowledge, skills, behaviors is in a sim center. There are also things that I can teach just by role modeling and just by living my values and basically quasi apprenticeship model, having them watch me be me in the workplace. And yeah, you know what? Sometimes you have to sit in a room and have a bit of chalk and talk death by PowerPoint. And, and by, by understanding that that's the answer, it stops you from falling into that trick of all those outdated myths about learning styles and this day. It's, it's absolute tosh. If you want to teach one thing, it's probably going to require you to be very different to you having to teach another thing. And the bit that, that medics and physicians in particular are very bad at, because we're told we're meant to be polymaths, right? We're told we're meant to be good at everything, be able to do everything. The real recognition is also going, I'm the wrong person to teach you that. I shouldn't be teaching you, I don't know, comm skills in the setting of. You should go speak to that person. And we're starting, we're slowly starting to get over ourselves enough to recognize that that's where the role of interdisciplinary and interprofessional learning comes from. Sometimes, we saw it a lot in the pandemic, sometimes the best person to teach you something isn't a doctor. It's an allied healthcare professional, it's a nurse, it's a member of the public, it's one of your peers. And we're getting over that, but again, it's all wrapped up in hierarchy. So the answer to your really simple question is, I, it depends. Oh, the proudest moment, clinical or otherwise, in my surgical career. I, I, I've been trying to think about this one for a while and, and there are loads of little moments. Um, I remember getting my training number. I remember getting my PhD. I remember passing my FRCS. I remember the, the first case I did, the last case I did for, for me, probably the proudest moment I had in my, in my surgical career, actually, again, it is in is in my my advocacy space and it's not one moment it's a load of little collections of it's a load of little pixels that make up a really big picture and it's when i give myself the chance to sit back and look over the last 15 years of work i've done in the surgical community trying to make it better and being able to see those little moments interpersonal interprofessional that now we're just so much further along we're still we've still got a ton of work to do but it's when i bump into people and they go i wasn't going to be a surgeon and then i heard about the work you were doing around diversity and i thought well, maybe i'll give it a second look and when i when i started the, the all the culture change work the standard question you get asked by these kind of neo-positivist quasi-quant surgeons is yeah but what are your metrics what are your kpis how are you going to prove how are you going to evidence that uh you've made a change uh i need a pie chart and a graph and what's your p-values and it's really hard to be like I i've i've changed the way who we are and my proudest moment is that we're having this conversation now that loads of people are having conversations about psychological safety, diversity, creating a sense of belonging, resilience in the real sense of the word, not the weaponized toxic sense of the word. Um, we're talking about women in surgery. We're talking about bullying and accountability. We're challenging patriarchy and systemic oppression and all that sort of stuff. And unashamedly, I was a very small cog in a process that has been going on for ages and ages and ages, but it turned a point 2014, 2015, and it was pretty much me in the UK 
and the, the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons and Rio Lang et al. in, in Oz and their Operate with Respect campaign. And and it sounds, it's very, um, you know, it, it it's that cringeworthy thing of like, it was a paradigm shift, but literally we changed direction. And when you ask people, and if they're really honest about it, we weren't talking about it or doing anything about it before 2014. It wasn't a thing, no one talked about it. And if they did, it was done in like hushed corners. You know, that guy's really problematic. Oh, you know what it's like, never mind. And and that's that's it for me, is, is the proudest moment is, I think, I was about to go kind of dark, but if I got hit by a bus tomorrow, I think that work would continue regardless. I think that direction of travel has built enough momentum and has brought on enough people and allies and it's on enough agendas that it can't be stopped. And and that new direction of travel for surgery and for healthcare, that 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 feels good. An exceptionally enjoyable weekend. <laughs> uh, honestly, I just had one. And it's probably my first weekend off because I've had the fellowship exam preceded by a global pandemic combined with a PhD plus, plus, plus. For me, a good weekend is time with my people, is, is, is time with friends and family where you can just uh, take the brakes off and relax. And, and I'm, I'm um, one of my, my, um, my partner doesn't really understand it, but I find cooking extremely relaxing. So I, this weekend cooked for like six or eight of us and it just brought me loads of joy. I came up with a menu and recipes. And I did prep and I did this and I did that. And I produced a big meal because for me, food is an expression and maybe it's an ethnic minority thing because I'm Jewish and maybe it's just because food is tasty, but, but food is a way of demonstrating love while simultaneously for me, kind of removing myself from all the chaos and being like, just for now, I just need to focus on this and I just need to make it good. Uh, so an exceptionally enjoyable weekend for me is where I don't look at my phone once. I don't open my laptop once. I'm just surrounded by people who I trust and care about and ideally there's really good food and slightly better wine. So it's interesting. And again, it depends on the people I've got, but um, I, I, there's a chef in, uh, in the States called David Chang. And he, he talks a lot about the food he cooks and he did a TikTok video about one of his like guilty pleasures. I don't really have guilty pleasures because I refuse to feel guilt for things that make me happy, but, but it's, I have a recipe. I've developed my own recipe now for pickle brined buttermilk fried chicken and caviar. It is neither healthy nor cheap and it's very over the top. It's a like once a year make it for friends kind of thing, but it's just delicious. And I made it this weekend for, for my friends that we went to stay with and they're both kind of foodie and you know, that kind of stuff. And they were kind of looking at me like, this is just one of those ridiculous things that's all affectation and all style over substance and then they ate it and they were like oh no this is this is really really good because uh, the other thing i do that i quite enjoy doing I, I cooked it one of my friends is a neurosurgeon called ruth mitchell um and she's the archetypal overachiever she managed to get the nobel peace prize while she was a registrar as you do um and she came over from australia and to visit me in london and and my other big meal I like to cook for her, I cook for people is is beef wellington. Because again, it's that kind of thing where you get to go, look at this. And again, it's just delicious. And it's big sharing food. And, and again, you sit around the table, put the world to rights, eat good food. So it's interesting when I think about my favorite book, my favorite book, is a guy is a book called I Lucifer, and it's just um, L Lucifer basically. God says to him, "Look, if you can behave for a period of time, I'll let you back. 
and and that's your challenge. Everything's forgiven. We can be buddies again. And it's a really dark comedic book where basically Lucifer tries to find little loopholes where he can still be kind of mischievous and chaotic while not technically breaking any rules. So, and and the reason I enjoy it is is it's it's kind of an ode to knowing yourself and being self-aware and and uh, having insight, which is something that increasingly I value both in myself and in others. Like self-awareness, just knowing who you are, what you want, what makes you happy. My favorite movie is one that I can, can I have two. It depends whether I want to be really happy or whether I want to be really introspective. So my favorite movie is a, is a John Favreau movie called Chef. And it's just foodie silliness with a great soundtrack. It just makes me happy. It just puts a smile on my face. It's it's about food and family and music and love. And it's just an easy recharge my battery kind of film. And then if I want to be sad in a good way, my other favorite movie is a film called uh, Big Fish. Really niche, really indie movie starring Ewan McGregor. But it fundamentally is about him, his, his dad gets sick and uh, his dad throughout his life told him all these tall tales and now is old and poorly and curmudgeonly. And throughout the film, he discovers that all of his dad's tall tales were true. And it's 100% my, my late father's life. So it makes me bawl my eyes out. Dad told me all these stories throughout my life and we all just thought that he, you know, he's this Australian GP who now lives in London, tells all these tall stories. And then as he got sicker and sicker, the stories got taller and taller. And we were like, yeah, sure, whatever. And then it turned out they were all true. So he passed and we start going through his stuff and we find that yes, he did get a medal when he was nine years old from the Czech army for fighting Nazis. And yes, he did do this. And yes, he did once own a pub in Tel Aviv or Jerusalem because he couldn't find a pub that served the beer he liked and played the music he liked so he and his mates just bought one and and so yeah it, it depends whether i want to be really really happy or whether i want like a quiet day with my thoughts